All right, thank you so much for being here. We're going to talk about lesson seven today. And if you recall, we have been talking about Jesus being on the way to Jerusalem with his disciples. And he has been telling them what to expect when they get there. And he has told them several times that when they get to Jerusalem, that the Son of Man will be betrayed, he will be arrested, he will be crucified, killed and buried, but that he would rise again. And he's told this to, to the disciples several times, and every time they have really strange reactions. Um, we talked about that a little bit last week. And what I want us to see today is the story of the Last Supper. And this is the time that Jesus shared with his disciples right before he was arrested. So they're kind of facing the moment of crisis. Um, we're going to begin with Mark 14, 27 where it says, you will all fall away. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples at this last meal and letting them know that they will all abandon him. And he tells them this in the course of this meal to prepare them for what he knows is coming. So what I want us to talk about is the fact that Jesus is betrayed, denied, and abandoned by his followers. Uh, first, Jesus was betrayed by one of his disciples, and that was Judas. Um, Jesus had a relationship with Judas. Judas had spent time with Jesus, um, but he would be the one who would end up betraying him. And we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, the disciple Peter, who ha had been the one to identify Jesus as the Messiah a few weeks ago, would be the one um, to deny even knowing Jesus before this night was over. And Jesus told him this. He said, before the rooster crows, you will deny even knowing me. But it's not just the two of them. It's not just Judas and Peter that are going to do this. All of the disciples would eventually abandon Jesus over the course of this night. So I want us to see that all of them abandoned Jesus, but that it wasn't a surprise to Jesus at all. He knew that this was coming. He was in control over the situation. But I think the greater question is why? Why did the disciples deny, abandon, and deny Jesus? Um, and I think it comes down to a few different things. And the first reason is just really simply that they were afraid. Um, they were weak and they were afraid about what was happening. They had given their lives to following Jesus. And as things are building, um, there's this moment of crisis. And they're afraid that if they're identified with Jesus, that the same thing could happen to them. And so this is when they begin to fall away. And the second thing is that they still didn't completely understand what it meant that Jesus was the Messiah, and they didn't know what sort of Messiah Jesus had come to be. And we've talked repeatedly over the weeks about how uh, their thought process about the Messiah um, was that he would be a liberator from the Roman Empire, kind of like Moses, a new Moses. Or they thought he was maybe like King David, who had set up this great political kingdom of Israel. Um, so that's kind of in their mindset, and Jesus is not uh, fulfilling those expectations. He's telling them that he's going to suffer and die, and this doesn't match up with what they expect in a Messiah. And so, um, and part of that is their confusion, and so they end up leaving Jesus and abandoning him. So the challenge of following Jesus. Uh, following Jesus is not easy. It's a difficult process, and I want us to see that we can't do it on our own. This is not something we're capable of doing on our own. Um, we can't be good enough or perfect enough on our own, that we need God's help. All of us are weak and afraid, but that Jesus is faithful despite our weaknesses. And I have here a picture um, on the left side is a picture of broken pottery. And this is a Japanese tradition called, I'm going to get this wrong, but it's kintsugi or kintsukorai pottery. And the idea is that they take broken pottery and they fuse it back together to make it whole, but they show the scars of where it was broken and they use gold to fuse the pieces back together. And I think this is such a beautiful image of what happens to us when we're broken in our sin. Um, that God is the one who pieces us back together, and, he, and Jesus fills the role of filling in the gaps and making up for our brokenness and making us whole again. So I want you to kind of keep that image in your mind as we go forward and we talk about the Last Supper, um, this idea of Jesus being the one that makes us whole. 
Okay, so we're going to read through this whole chapter of Mark 14 and talk about the Last Supper and this meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. So it says, When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. And I want us to see here that all of the disciples knew that they were capable of betraying Jesus because all of them respond, surely you don't mean me. Somewhere in their hearts, they knew that there was a piece of them that was um, capable of running away and abandoning Jesus. Okay, Jesus goes on and he says, it is one of the 12, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. What I want us to see is that Jesus shared this last meal with the disciples, even though he knew they would all abandon him. He knew this already. Um, He knew that he was eating with a group of people that would abandon him at his greatest need, but still he goes on to give of himself completely to the same group of people. Um, He wasn't surprised. Jesus knew exactly the details of what were coming uh, that evening, and he'd been telling the disciples for weeks, here's what you should expect. Um, So he knew exactly what was happening. So let's talk a little bit about what caused Judas to betray Jesus. Um, Jesus said, it's the one who dips his bread into the bowl with me, and that was Judas. Um, Judas wanted a different kind of Messiah. He'd given his life uh, to follow Jesus these last few years, and uh, he was responsible for keeping the money for the group of disciples. And the Bible tells us that Judas used to help himself to the money um, that was kept in their in their communal purse, um, which tells us a little bit about what was uh, central in the heart of Judas. Like if we could open up his heart and look inside, we would see dollar signs or whatever the equivalent was in first century Israel, um, maybe silver coins. But Judas, uh, in, in his longing in the deepest part of his heart, uh, he wanted God for what God could give him and not for God himself. And Judas was focused on seeing Jesus rise in power and authority and Judas was interested in having a seat at the table of authority and power, um, and that's connected to this idea of money. So we see that Judas uh, was willing to betray Jesus because he wanted a different kind of Messiah, not a suffering Messiah that Jesus came to be. So some of that we're just sort of reading into what we know about Judas and trying to figure out what caused him to be Jesus's betrayer. Okay. Uh, Moving on, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. So this is the institution of the Last Supper. This is Jesus giving his uh, body and blood through the symbols of bread and wine. And he's inviting all of the disciples to share in this meal. So he's sharing of himself with them. Um, and it's an, it, he's showing them in symbolic form what he's going to do later that night. So he's, he's explaining to them the purpose of his death. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. So Jesus knew, again, he knew what was going to happen. He knew they were all going to fall away. He's reminding them of that. But I love this, that he he stops and he says, listen, I'm going to go ahead of you into Galilee. Knowing all that he knows about what's coming, He says, listen, there's a crisis ahead. Big things are going to happen. But just remember this piece of information. After everything is over, after it's completed, I'm going ahead of you into Galilee. So I just love this, that they could hold on to that and remember when everything got crazy, he's waiting for us. 
he's remembered us and he's waiting for us in Galilee. Um, and he told them that he was going to meet them there. And then Peter goes on. I love this about Peter, right? He declares, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter goes on and he insists emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all of the others said the same. So we have a little self-awareness problem among the disciples. Um, they are convinced that they will stick it out with Jesus. But Jesus knows. He knows they're not really up to the challenge of following him all the way to the cross. And he loves them and he prepares them. Listen, I will be waiting for you, but I know you're going to fall away. And then Peter is like, everyone except me. I mean, I'm not going to do that. And Jesus goes on and says, you know what, Peter, I love you, and I love that you are so enthusiastic, but um, you're going to hear the rooster crow, and that's going to remind you that you yourself have, will deny me. Um, so, and I just, how lovingly Jesus prepares them for what's ahead. So lessons from the Last Supper. What do we learn from this? Um, first of all, that Jesus gave himself completely for his followers, and he gives them these symbols, and he says, this represents my body, this represents my blood, I'm doing this for you, for the forgiveness of sin. So he's teaching them and preparing them uh, for what's to come. And the second thing is that the only prerequisite for participation in this meal was and is an awareness of need. Um, Jesus is giving his life to restore our brokenness, He's, he's giving his body and blood uh, and symbol through the bread and wine um, that, as an indication that he's going to die for their sin. So he's giving them this object lesson. Uh, and I want us to see that the meal itself represents a restored relationship with God. And he's, um, so he's giving them this, this meal to them and he's saying all that you need to have to, in order to enter into a relationship with God is an awareness of your need. And then finally, that Jesus is sharing this meal with traitors and cowards. He knows who's at the table with him, um, but still he loves them and still he gives himself to them. So what does all of this mean for us? Uh, faithfulness and failure. Jesus was faithful and the disciples were weak, and we've seen that demonstrated um, by how they behaved. But in the same way, we are weak and afraid, and we can't follow Jesus on our own. We're not capable of being good enough or perfect enough to follow him on our own. But also that Jesus is faithful despite our failures. When we are weak, he is strong. He steps in and takes our place um, and does it on our behalf. So that brings us to grace. Uh, grace is a free gift of forgiveness and restoration. That is the definition of grace. And grace addresses our greatest need, which is our need to have our sins forgiven. And grace is available when we repent and believe. And we'll talk a little bit about repentance and belief. We've talked about this previously in other weeks, but just to highlight this again, repentance means agreeing with God of, that we are broken and unable to fix ourselves. So just as we saw in that broken pottery, it's not able to fix itself. Uh, it's not capable of doing that on its own. Um, so repentance really just means coming into agreement with God that we need his help. And belief, when Jesus talks about belief, he means agree that God has provided a solution to our sin and our brokenness through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Belief just means agreeing with God that Jesus has done the work for us on our behalf. So grace is possible because Jesus was faithful and obedient to God. Where we were incapable of fixing ourselves, Jesus is the one, the only one who could do that on our behalf. So I want us to see as we close that God sent his son to die in our place and to take the punishment for our sin. He did what we couldn't do. Um, and he did this so that we could be restored and made whole like that pottery. Um, Jesus came to fix our brokenness and to restore us into relationship with God. So I hope that as you go into your group time that you can talk about this, keep that image of the broken pottery, 
and the fixed pottery that shows the gold shows the places where God fills in the gaps with his own goodness. Um, keep those images in mind. Talk about in your groups um, how God used Jesus to take our place uh, through his death and resurrection, and I hope that is a benefit to you. I'm going to pray to wrap us up. Thank you so much for listening. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you uh, knew what was coming and that you were still willing to go and to face this crisis on our behalf. I thank you that you were the perfect sacrifice and substitution for us uh, because we can't do it on our own. We can't fix our problem. We're not perfect enough. Lord, I pray that you would bless these folks as they head into their time of discussion that you would meet them there, that you would give them insight into your goodness. And I thank you that you go before us and that you are willing to meet us on the other side, even though we are weak and we are tend to abandon you. I thank you that you stick with us. Lord, bless our time together. In your name I pray. Amen.